thanks for your introduction and uh, thanks uh, the organizers for uh, this fantastic workshop. I've uh, been coming here two years in a row, or at least uh, to this idea of two years. Uh, it's nice to be back also in this interesting institute. So, uh, you know, some people have been uh, obsessed uh, with uh, classifying uh, topological phases, like our chairman here. Um, I am obsessed with quantization and finding uh, quantized responses in topological matter because if you think about it, there are experimentally not so many quantized observables that we have observed as a community. Uh, now, So yeah, of course we know about the quantum hole uh, conductivity, the quantization in linear response of, of the transverse uh, conductivity, um, which uh, you know is a kind of stereotypical example of quantization of topological states. Uh, I like actually uh, an experiment that uh, one of our organizers did, which was showing that even in a 3D measurement you could um, you could get quantization, which is you know you take a TI, you gap it with a with a magnetic field. And you shine light, and you look for rotations in the plane of polarization. And by measuring current parity of rotation, you can kind of smartly um, kill all the non-universal uh, parameters and uh, measure uh, something quantized. So that's, I think, a very neat, neat experiment. But um, recently, also with uh, some people in the audience, uh, like Fernando and uh, well, uh, Liang and and uh, Minghai, have also been studying these kind of things. Also, Inti. Uh, we kind of push the barrier to uh, nonlinear effects as well, uh, and what, uh, in particular, we were interested in what types of effects uh, could be quantized in nonlinear in nonlinear optics. So going to the next order, and also in metals rather than insulators, which is the typical place where we find quantization. So this you will hear about in Fernando's uh, talk tomorrow. Um, so this is one of my motivations, like try to find uh, quantization in experiments or help, uh, you know help to think of experiments that can show quantization uh, kind of simply. And also, uh, some kind of side question is how does quantization really look in real space? Uh, sometimes we, we don't think about this, but in fact, again, uh, you know, following some, some more or less recent works, you can also map somehow where is the quantization uh, in real space. So I'll get to that um, in a second. So, uh, you know, my setup is always gonna be shine light, absorb, and uh, look for some response, some optical response. And uh, my punchline uh, is already here. Is circular dichroism is gonna, uh, is gonna make you be able to distinguish different types of chiral or higher order topological phases, and it's gonna be actually quantized to integers. So, um, so I'll explain briefly what three uh, higher order DIs are, although there have been introduced like the, the Helical version of, of the models I've been using have been already discussed, and I'll also uh, explain what by me, what I mean by circular dichroism. So, the first thing that you might not know, but it's a very old result, is that uh, actually circular dichroism measures DC Hall conductivity. And how that? So I'm gonna you know be brave here and, and guide you through a very simple derivation of how this is true. So take the absorbed power. So if you look into an ENM uh, book, you'll see that uh, it's just the real part of this product of uh, J times E, J star times E. So J is the current, E is the electric field, P is the power absorbed, A is the area of your system. Now, go assume linear response and introduce this here, it's trivially this. Now, if you think of circularly polarized light, your electric field looks something like this. It has this funny plus minus I, you do I omega T. Now introduce this. Uh, like really very simple, and you get uh, the real part of the longitudinal conductivity plus minus the whole conductivity, right? So now you already see that you can kind of, uh, by subtracting left and right polarizations, you can already isolate the, the sigma xy, which is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to use the uh, property of the English language, which is the power absorbed is the same as absorbed power, the community of the English language, and now I'm going to say that power absorbed is also the energy that you absorb uh, times the number of carriers that are uh, being excited due to that energy. So that's h bar omega times the, the excitation rate, gamma. And this depends on the polarization in general. Now, uh, right, so now I'm going to do what I was promising, just subtract left and right and integrate over frequencies. Okay. 
So this is what this delta gamma that I'm going to plot many times in this talk is going to be. So just left minus right um, absorption rates uh, integrated over omega. Now, if you do this just by the formula that's up there, uh, you'll find that you exactly isolate sigma x y, the imaginary part of sigma x y over omega. And now you know that uh, for analytic functions, basically uh, the real and imaginary parts are related by Kramer's chronic. So this immediately gives you the real part of the whole connectivity. So just by measuring absorption, you can measure the DC whole connectivity provided you integrate over all frequencies. Okay, so this is kind of already well known. It was known by uh, Vernon Stern, uh, Bennett and Stern. Stern is not the Stern, we all know. Um, and also, Sosa and Vanderbilt kind of pointed out in, a, in the model language. Now, if you have a 2D insulator, this immediately implies that this is quantized to the Chern number of the field band or some of the field band. Okay? And in fact, you can uh, even do this experiment and has been done in, in uh, cold atoms uh, by this uh, cold atomic realizations of Chern insulators. They have uh, driven uh, some, some collection of cold atoms into a Chern insulator state and then further dri driven the system with uh, circularly polarized light, which means just uh, shaking in their case, and measure this quantization. Now the thing is that if you, um, if you actually do this uh, driving to a whole system, a uh, whole finite system, you would actually get zero. So actually the total circular diagram is zero in finite samples. So let me prove this to you in two, two different ways. One is actually related, so you can see, you can see this either in real space or in uh, energy space. So let's, let's see uh, in uh, real space how this works. So you can actually uh, compute something that's called the local term marker which is something that is simply the Fourier transform of the Berry curvature. You Fourier transform of the, Fourier, the Berry curvature to real space, and you'll get this formula which depends on the commutator of, of Qx and Py. P is just a projector towards the ground state of your system, so you're projecting to the field state, and Q is one minus P. So a, a commutator or a finite Hilbert space is zero, so that's mathematically why this is zero. And if you plot it, if you plot it like a space result, you just choose some localized basis and plot this for your favorite churn insulator, you'll get the following uh, picture where um, quantization uh, happens really in the bulk. So you see that here I chose a, to fill a band with term number minus one. So the bulk is really nicely quantized to minus one. So when I average over the bulk area, I would get minus one. But the edge states <laughs> contribute exactly, uh, if I sum over them, con uh, they contribute exactly with the opposite sign and, uh, and they exactly cancel the bulk. So this is why you get zero. So since the, since the quantity I was talking about is exactly related to this uh, local term marker, um, then you will get zero if you average over the whole sample. If you just probe the bulk of your system, you get quantization. And you'll see why I insist on this uh, later on. Now, if you want to see it in real space, you can actually, uh, sorry, in energy space, you can actually calculate this uh, absorption by looking at which transitions contribute to it. So you take the Fermi Golden rule and you uh, calculate matrix elements and you separate the ones that connect bulk to bulk states, edge to bulk, or edge to edge. And you'll see that, that the edge to edge, uh, uh, kind of as you increase your system size, exactly go to one, the bulk bulk exactly go to minus one, and the edge to bulk kind of go to zero, and then die out. So the, the, the edge to edge and the bulk to bulk exactly cancel in the um, like large system unit. But finite. Okay, so this is kind of the the, the energy uh, uh, the energy uh, resolved version of this of this uh, property of the, of this um, dichroism. And now I want to use this to somehow filter out um, filter out one of these contributions to to um, to distinguish chiral higher order topological states. And later on, we'll ask the question of how this um, topological content is actually distributed in real space. So here's my one slide on, on higher order topology. So uh, we, so okay, so higher order, order topological states, you know, you can define many dimensions, but we're, we're thinking about 3D and also time reversal broken. So, um, you know, this was, this has been studied by many people, including Andrea and others, but we used some, um, some models that I, you know, this paper that I just put here because it's the model I'm, we're using it's just a combination of the of two models that appear here. So what is this? What are these models? 
and which uh, kind of uh, interpolate between different types of, of states. So you have a strong topological insulator if you want, and then you gap it out in two ways, either by a Zeeman coupling, so this just depending on where it points, it'll gap different surfaces, um, but, so it will break time reversal symmetry, but preserve inversion. And, uh, and, this, and the term that, um, that preserves uh, C4Z rotations uh, uh, combined with time reversal, but not these symmetries independently. So by modeling, uh, like modulating the, the parameters of this model, you can go from a DI to, uh, to states that have, to 3D states that have uh, Carroll hinge modes uh, in different hinges, depending on the parameters. So these are the two models that we have studied. And I'll, I'll kind of relate this one to something that has been proposed uh, as a material candidate for this paper. So what, let's see what, what do we get. So here's, here's this uh, difference um, absorption rate uh, plotted as a function of frequency. This, the particular shape doesn't really matter. It depends on the band structure and the speaks you get in different uh, absorption, uh, like uh, in the, on the joint density of states and so on. But what I want to, what I want to uh, highlight is that it depends actually on the, on the polarization plane that I choose. So let's say if I shine light, circular polarized light in, in the uh, what did I choose again? XY plane, then I get some finite, finite result, uh, which is this curve, the solid curve. If you shine light in this XZ plane, so you turn this off and you shine light now in the XZ plane, you get exactly zero. So this means that there's some surface dependence on this absorption. And uh, you can see it already, let's say you, you, you uh, take the one that does not, does not give zero, which is this XY polarization, and you'll get something very similar to the change later case I was saying. The bulk bulk uh, contribution gives a one in this case, the edge edge or hinge hinge if you want, uh, gives um, gives uh, something that's opposite and equal, and then the, the edge to bulk and bulk to edge actually, which I'm not showing, um, actually vanish. So of course the total sum is zero because I showed you that for a finite sample, and this is a result that is independent of dimensionality, so uh, for a finite sample, the total circular diagram is zero, but the bulk bulk and the edge edge uh, are contributed, contributing in a non-trivial way, one with plus one and the other one with minus one. So how do you understand pictorically this? Is that, uh, well, when you, what you're doing is basically uh, you're, you're sharing like with a particular plane of polarization and you're projecting your whole state to that plane. So what you have to ask is whether you have some sort of whole effect uh, or 2D whole effect projected to the plane. So in this case, uh, you see that the uh, hinge states exactly um, project into a closed circuit and then you go back in, in some sense to the change later picture. However, in the other plane of polarization, you get exactly zero because, well, whenever you absorb left, you absorb with right because the, uh, the plane of polarization, when you project uh, your, your, your 3D state into that plane, you'll see that, that whenever you have a left mover, you have a right mover. So you get exactly zero. Now, this is all very good, but I still haven't told you how to separate the bulk and the edge because if you shine your whole sample, you'll get zero. So how, how do you do this? So how do you get quantization? In principle, you could you could try to measure the bulk and say, well, the bulk is independent. You know, if, if my sample is large enough, then the bulk uh, would already be quantized. But the problem is that you have to integrate over all frequencies. And if you ask an experimentalist, integrating over all frequencies is hard uh, because there are many. So so then, it, and and sometimes you actually have finite samples. So you might want to actually you have, might actually want to measure what happens to the hinge states, right? So, yeah, most of the times you have quite. <laughs> so, um, so then, how how can you filter this out? Well, a, a neat trick actually is that in a kind of very simpler, simple, I think, uh, in experiment, is to integrate until some uh, cutoff, uh, chosen in such a way that that is less um, than the bulk gap. And the reason is that if the cutoff is less than the bulk gap. The only states that are activated is going to be uh, the only transitions that are going to be activated is edge to edge, while the bulk bar are going to be uh, not allowed because they they require too much energy, and the edge to bulk are anyway going to die out if you have uh, large enough samples. So if you if you calculate this, so here's here's what I'm showing. I'm showing now this um, delta gamma, this difference uh, in absorption, integrated up to a frequency omega max. So here's the frequency. Um, you'll see that. More or less, you have one uh, or like 
you look at it. You have a, a jump at the beginning, and then more or less a flat um, line until, uh, of course, this is kind of uh, you know um, affected by finite size effects. But but in principle, for larger enough samples, you'll get a jump until until one, and then uh, it will be more or less a plateau until you hit the energy of the gap, and then something non-universal will happen and eventually die out to zero as you as you go to higher and higher frequencies. So this is how you would tell one where is your uh, bulk gap, and two or your, yeah your bulk gap, and two where uh, where your edge states and uh, enter in this calculation. So if you so if you just measure this differential absorption as a function of, of integrating frequency cutoff, so this of uh, omega max, then you'll you'll get the quantized result coming from the edge state. So what, what, what's J? Uh, J is the hopping. Yeah, it's just the it's just the natural energy scale of, of the models we're using. So, um, so just to like pictorically uh, sum this up, if you take your um, your uh, light source and point it into some uh, project it into some plane of polarization, then uh, project your three D state into the plane of polarization you chose, then you might get for this inversion Hottie, which has a inversion protected Hottie, or sometimes referred to also as axial oscillator, I, I believe. Um, you will see that this uh, hinge state projects into an exactly closed surface, uh, which in this case uh, rotates uh, clockwise. So then you get chair number one. But if you if you choose the other direction, you get something that is anti-clockwise anti -clockwise and, and get minus one. However, for the for the roto inversion hot this C four Z inversion hot um, this will uh, actually uh, give either one or zero, as I was telling you uh, before. So if in, in one case, you would get a, 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 you know, a, a projection which is exactly uh, similar to a, to, um, to a change later, well, well, in the other surface, another plane of polarization, you'll get something that does not close. So it, yeah. Now, what about experiments, real materials? Do we have, do we have some, somewhere to look for these things? Uh, there was a recent nice paper by Shidai's group um, in this, in this unpronounceable compound, it means to me, uh, which is anti-ferromagnetic in one phase. And you have uh, a bulk gap. So these are the surface states that are gapped because of this anti-ferromagnetic uh, state. And you have the hinge states uh, coming along here, which are chiral because it breaks universal symmetry. And in principle, it's like the um, universal breaking cousin of bismuth. So we were seeing this uh, this morning how you have you can have uh, helical edge states in bismuth, but in, in this compound this these things are actually parallel. So if you would shine uh, circularly polarized light into this surface and in principle this can be grown, um, then you would, you would see you would exactly predict a quantized response uh, due to the projection of this hinge states um, that I was telling you about. Now. Uh, this kind of uh, motivated us to ask as well, what, what was the, like how does really, you know, since circular diagrams is related to this local term marker, how does this actually play out in a, in a 3D sample? And, and what can you learn about it? So an expectation that people that know about TIs know is that uh, whenever you gap a surface of a TI, you basically get a half uh, E square over H conductance due to the gap uh, direct states. So this was known uh, long ago, and you can do a very simple calculation. Basically, you can do a layer resolved calculation of the churn number. This was already done by in this paper by by uh, Joe Moore and and uh, Vanderbilt and and and, Gresson. and basically, what you do is that uh, you calculate this local churn num uh, local churn marker as a function of uh, the height, this z, and you see that one edge state, depending on how you gap it, but one edge state. Um, contributes with plus one half or minus one half if you choose the opposite sign, and the other one uh, does the same. So, so basically, at each surface, you have a half quantized conductance uh, in units of E square over H. Now, this, this is a universal, a universal property of topological oscillators. But, but I just told you that, that in a churn oscillator, actually, this bulk quantization gets exactly quantized, exactly compensated by the, by the edge states. So how does this play out in a in a higher order topology oscillator? So here's if you choose a, a particular uh, polarization, let's say a particular um, realization of this local term marker, I chose it to be in the x y plane. Then you'll get you'll get a contribution, this red uh, uh, contribution coming from the hinge states, 
something that is basically zero in, in the surfaces that are perpendicular to this x, y uh, uh, plane, and then something that looks uh, close to minus 1 half uh, in, in the top and bottom surfaces. So let me zoom in. And you'll see exactly what you expect for the bulk. So something that is close to uh, minus 1 half, and it's not exactly quantized because you, know, you have to make this larger and larger. But if you look, if you look close to like this, this central uh, dots are the ones that are easier to converse. So you, you get very nice composition here. But then you, you get some opposite sign contribution from the hinge states, which is maybe not so surprising given what I told you already. However, if you one thing you, you notice immediately is that, of course, if I sum over the whole surface, <coughs> Uh, the, um, the local term marker for a change layer is zero, but for uh, uh, this higher order topological state is not zero. So it's, in this sense, is, uh, you can already see that it's not coming from a, from, a 2D, from a 2D state, but rather a 2D surface. And moreover, the, this average, contrary to what maybe one could expect, is that uh, you know, unlike the bulk, which is always quantized to minus 1 half, or plus 1 half, um, the average over the, over the surface is actually non-universal. So how do you see this? You kind of separate. You have to separate uh, the bulk, or the surface bulk, with the contribution of the horizontal hinge and the vertical hinge. And now you try. You try to make. Uh, you know, if you have this very symmetric uh, drawing here, you might think that the horizontal hinge and the vertical hinge actually contribute the same. And it turns out, if you if you you can you can. Um, change the hopping in this vertical direction without spoiling the symmetry that, that, uh, that protects this state. So basically, you can kind of elongate the cylinder or reduce it in, in the z direction. And now, and see how the, the weight of the local term marker between the hinges uh, change, changes. So let's look first at the bulk. The bulk is uh, the average over the bulk, and which is a bit of a thicker, um, thicker uh, Surface because uh, you know the, the penetration depth of the of the surface states. Uh, the bulk is basically quantized to something that is close to 0.5. Again, it's a quite a small system. So if you look at just one point here, the bulk it would be very close to 0.5, but the whole average is, is a bit uh, off. But that's uh, impressive bulking. Okay. Uh, now the different symbols. You see that the different symbols basically fall on top of each other, on top of each other, and they represent the asymmetry between the hoppings in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. But now if you look at uh, the hinge uh, modes, the hinges actually, uh, if you get a very symmetric, uh, a, a totally symmetric uh, hopping in the, in the vertical and the horizontal directions, then this uh, contribution of the hinges goes to the same value. But as you start deviating from this very symmetric limit, uh, which are these other uh, crosses and, and dots, then they start deviating. And so this is telling you that if you sum over the whole surface, which is this, uh, Extra extra line here, you actually can get whatever you want essentially. So this this is telling you that this this uh, this uh, local term marker of a single surface is actually non-universal. The bulk of the surface is universal, but if you add the hinges, it's actually not. So that distinguishes basically from a Turner's later. Uh, now, uh, yeah, this is my my final slide. I'm just gonna sum up. I told you that basically quantized. This, the quantized circular diagram distinguishes different types of higher topological states, uh, chiral higher topological states, basically by measuring the, the projection of the whole conductivity to the plane of polarization, and uh, the average of the local term marker, or how the, this, uh, this uh, local uh, term marker is distributed over the 3D space, actually distinguishes the surface of a, of a, of a, of a, well, of a higher order topological insulator from a, from a trivial uh, Chern oscillator, even though uh, you might think that you can deform one into into another uh, just by thinking of a, of a sphere, for example. But okay, so this this is uh, uh, my final slide, and uh, thank you for your attention. Can you make a big sort of uh, like torus where the inside and the outside are like so? There's no, if you make a hingeless torus out of the the hobby, is the local trim marker quantized then on the inside and the outside? Hingeless. Okay, so let me understand. So hingeless. So I make torus. I make it periodic in two directions and then just have a surface on the inside and the outside basically. So it looks like a hollow donut, but like it's just like connecting the x and y directions there. Like there's a top and a bottom, and the, ah. the it's infinite this way. Okay. <coughs> periodic, let's say, yeah. And what's the question? 
Is the local trend marker quantized on the top and the bottom then if you get rid of the, if you kill the hinges? Uh, okay, like the bulk definitely is quantized. I think in that situation, um, yeah, the, the I think the claim is that basically the the you know the symmetry doesn't impose that the horizontal and the vertical hinges contribute the same. But, okay. But the horizontals, all the horizontals contribute the same because they get mapped into to themselves. So, so I would say in that case it would be quantized. So you get a half and a half or half minus half something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So could you go back to the slide where you have the argument for why the total circular dichroism vanishes? Uh, the one, let's say this one. Yeah, this one's fine. Okay. So you have this formula where you say that it vanishes because it's the integral of the local churn marker. The local churn marker integrates to zero. Mm -hmm. In the previous slide, you said that it was also the real part of the DC Hall conductivity. Yeah. Okay, but certainly for a finite size system, the real part of the DC Hall conductivity is non zero. I can, you know, connect my terminals and measure it. So it seems like there's something going on with the Q and omega limits. Yeah, that could be, yeah. Um, I mean, it's different. I mean, as you know, like, measuring transport and measuring optics is not the same thing, right? As, as so is the, is the sigma hall uh, omega equals zero that enters into this formula for delta gamma at Q equals zero or at finite Q? Uh, I would say it's taking the Q to zero limit first. Uh, so it's at zero Q, but but you've taken the Q to zero limit first. But if I take the Q to zero limit first, then I get nu over two pi for a two-dimensional system. But is this not just because there's no magnetic field? I mean, sigma x y should be zero. No, but I mean you're broken you broken diversal. So, but I mean if you if you're thinking of, of if you're measuring in, in contacts, let's say you're measuring the edges. Oh, I, can do it. I can do it with Laughlin flash pumping as well. It's still. I know. I suspect there's something subtle with the Q goes to zero limit. Yeah, I would have to think about what is exactly going on. Q goes to zero limit, so it goes to infinity. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so the, if there's something subtle, so it will be there. Can't define a sample. I mean, mathematically, it's just like, like the local term marker mathematically is very easy to prove that uh, uh, it has to go to zero because it's uh, oh, no, that part. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally clear. The thing that's not clear is yeah, why yeah. in a finite system the integral of the local term marker is the Hall conductivity. I think it's probably something. To, yeah, it's, it's tricky to take the thermodynamic limit then, I guess. Okay, that's yeah. So I'm, I'm actually also a little bit confused with that. Uh, the sum rule is equal to the DC Hall conductivity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is that generally true? Uh, so for an experimental system that you can actually have the DC Hall conductivity to have extrinsic contributions, right? Say the anomalous Hall conductivity mm -hmm. that has skew scattering, side jump, and that type of stuff. I think this, this argument is independent of what enters what enters the, the Hall conductivity. Because it's just, a, it's just a matter of how much power is absorbed and then, you know, if you have impurity states, they can contribute. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's the thing that I'm actually a little bit confused okay. because the DC part of the anomalous Hall conductivity can depend on whether you put scattering in it or not. But, you know, when you sum up over all the frequencies, it seems to me that that, that part, the sum rule part, is just related to how many, you know, uh, the density of spins in the system. Right, so there's a you know well-known optical sum rule that when you integrate over all frequency, that's only dependent on the number of you know, the density of atoms in the system. But that's long you do know for. Yeah. So uh, so if you yeah take into account you know the the, the off-diagonal part, that is it actually related to the number of spins or number of dipole moments? I, I don't think the off-diagonal part is related. I mean, it's I think the off-diagonal part just measures whatever whole connectivity you have, including. Uh, so the integral would then depend on how dirty the system is, right? So it depends on whether the, 
because the DC part of the Hall conductivity yeah, yeah, yeah. depends on whether you have skew scattering or not. Then the corresponding integral which is dependent on that, so not related. Yeah, but it's integral of the imaginary part of the signal point. But maybe, yeah, yeah, I have to understand better your point. But I think uh, as long, I mean, the, the the proof is quite. I mean, you don't have don't assume anything about scattering. I guess I guess one thing that assumes. Uh, Okay, that maybe implicitly I assume is that you have uh, translational invariants because uh, you know this area factor there. In, like in general, this this uh, this formula actually you have to integrate over uh, over space. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe that's where the subtlety comes from. <clears throat> and maybe that's actually a way to answer better. Uh, about this Cairo Hotty. And you argued, it's true if you only map, you just mirror a kind of equivalent Hawking connectivity. That is, you, you'll also get quantized. Yeah, you can, you can in principle add contacts and... But it's like, it's a complicated quantum hole. Yeah, but I would argue that optical experiments are always cleaner, uh, in the sense that, you know... <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I'm, I'm they did to the minus twelve quantization. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, supposedly the, the spin hole effect should be quantized as well. Yeah, yeah. In principle, uh, I guess the, the the problem there is that you know if, if you have a sample, of, if you would have to attach contacts. I don't know, Philip can tell us, but it seems kind of tricky to attach contacts in different ways in different surfaces uh, for the same sample. While here, you just have to you know, shine uh, light with one plane of polarization and basically you know, rotate your sample or something. That's, it seems to be easier. <laughs> I don't know. You can, you can correct me. I'm, I'm not so sure that, that, that you need that, because even if you contact the entire site, there is only one mode touching it, right, on the bottom. So, so I think this you could, you could do. But actually, I have a, one, one other question. In all of, you, all of the things that you considered in 2 and 3D, it was kind of a, a, from a topological point of view of the sample, somewhat of a contractible sample. So what if you, what if you add a hole or something non-trivial to the shape? Will this then basically form a, 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 a also a whole inner? Yeah, yeah, so actually, uh, this might relate to what Raquel was telling us uh, this morning. Like, if you have yeah. some defect, and this defect carries a, let's say, take take this dislocation that has a quantum spin hole. Now, take the Carroll version of that that has a yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that would contribute to the circular dichroism for sure. So then, in principle, it would be a I mean, you could detect the defects that have um, edge states around them. No, but if you just would drill a, a mundane hole. Mm -hmm. Not not this type of chiral defect. Just make a hole inside, because it seems to me that then you have to drill it uh, respecting the symmetry, though. Like if you break C4i, then everything is fine. Yeah, sure. Okay. The yeah, symmetry. then then yeah, then that that would contribute as well. Like anything that projects to the planar polarization that has a um, non-zero or like let's say a, a closed circuit contribute will contribute. So you would have to let's say take that contribution uh, times the area of that hole and subtract it with the with the contribution of the outer edge and the area. So basically, it would be a difference of areas. You have to. There was. There would be some uh, uh, geometrical factor in it that we you would have to take into account. But would you not be able to then probe? I mean, this is, wouldn't that be a very nice probe? Because presumably the outer state wouldn't change. It doesn't care if you drill a hole in the inside. Mm -hmm. But you now change the flux. Right, so the flux to the outer thing will still the same, but then now you capture some flux flux in the inner thing, which if it's an entirely local state of some sort, you shouldn't care. Uh, I'm not sure I, I know what you mean with capturing flux, but... Uh, but well, or light, the, the area yeah, yeah. projection that you used to... Yeah, 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 that's right. That's, that's, that's like if you, if you drill a hole, it will contribute as well to this, to this uh, or at least it would say subtract part of what you were seeing without the hole. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey.